Political, Territorial, and Legal Issues, Possible Solutions, Unit 14. Remember back in uh, Unit 10 when we discussed uh, political, legal, and territorial issues. Um, we're going to take a look today at maybe some possible solutions to some of the issues that we run into there. Um, of all of the things facing urban farmers, those interested in urban agriculture in general, um, dealing with the political and legal side of things uh, can sometimes be the most daunting task. And that's especially true of anyone growing food for sale, as opposed to having your own garden or being part of a community garden. Um, in this unit, we'll look at some possible solutions to some of the issues that we first examined in Unit 10. Let's review some of the types of ordinances that we looked at in Unit 10 that may be restrictive to the practice of urban agriculture. Things such as beekeeping bans or livestock bans, um, restrictions on the locations of vegetable gardens, ordinances against unkempt appearance, watering restrictions, processing facility requirements and environmental regulations. Now, as we noted in Unit 10, there are many more regulations and restrictions that we have to deal with. For instance, just under the category of environmental regulations, there are a whole host of things that we need to be aware of. Um, but the things listed here seem to be the things that are most commonly encountered. Take a quick look at beekeeping bans. Um, we need pollinators for successful agriculture, not just urban agriculture, but any agriculture. How do we make sure that we have the pollinators necessary for successful urban agriculture. First and foremost, education. Fear, ignorance, or misinformation are the leading causes of restrictive beekeeping and many other restrictive ordinances. People are afraid of being stung. The truth is though that honeybees very rarely sting anyone other than the beekeeper. Why? because when a honeybee stings, it dies. So for a honeybee, stinging is a last resort. Um, wasps and yellow jackets are usually the culprit in stinging incidents. People can't tell the difference between a wasp or a yellow jacket or a honeybee. They get stung. Anything with a stinger therefore is bad. Um, the reason that honeybees sting is to protect their hive. The young bees and the brood that's in the hive and their food supply. They may also sting if they are personally in a life threatening situation, such as you grab one or step on one or something like that. Um, but when they're flying from one place to another, they will almost never sting. When they're gathering nectar or pollen from flowers, they have no need to sting anyone. That's why beekeepers are most often the people stung by honeybees, is we're the ones going into the hives, opening up the hives, uh, rummaging around in their nest, and it's something that they don't really care for. Even then, uh, they may not sting. Um, I personally have beehives and have been in the hives. Um, have gone an entire season without being stung once, even opening hives every couple of weeks. Um, another thing is fear of allergic reactions. You'll hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm allergic to bee stings. The fact is that most people who say they're allergic to bee stings aren't, in fact, allergic to bee stings. There's a range of normal responses to being stung by any stinging insect, ranging from, you know, mild pain to severe pain to 
redness at the site of the sting to, you know, swelling and that sort of thing. If you get stung on the hand and your hand swells up like a softball, that's part of the normal range of reactions to being stung. That's not an allergic reaction. An allergic reaction is, an action, is a reaction that is systemic. That is, it has an effect remote from the place where you've been stung, typically manifested in closed airways, difficulty breathing, um, and anaphylactic shock. And very few people actually meet the criteria of being allergic to uh, bees. Far fewer than think they are. Um, also, there's a fear of attracting pests, of attracting pests. Um, people think if, well, I've got all these bees here, then there are going to be more potential other pests, you know, such as maybe wasps or yellow jackets or um, skunks or raccoons or something coming in. Um, but the truth is that honeybees guard their homes. And pests, other than those that specifically affect honeybees, like varroa mites and, and that sort of thing, um, are extremely rare around beehives. So most of the reasons that people give for not wanting bees and be, uh, honeybees around are related to misinformation. So how do we combat this? Well, here, Here's an example. The city of Madison, Wisconsin, enacted a beekeeping ordinance in 2012, legalizing beekeeping within the city limits. The legislation that they came up with was the result of education and input by beekeepers, including national beekeeping organizations. Common sense and education were the keys to crafting an ordinance that works and information about the ordinance is one of the reading assignments for this unit. You can see what they finally came up with. And I think you'll see that it's a, it's a pretty good ordinance and one that could be potentially used as a model in other locations. If you need help um, in crafting an ordinance, or changing the existing one. There are organizations that people can turn to uh, for help. Uh, first would probably be the American Beekeeping Federation. Um, here's their website. Um, also, Backyard Beekeepers. And they'll have lists of local beekeeping groups. They will also have information about other ordinances and things that have been enacted and can give you suggestions. Um, all the states, every state has beekeeping associations. So you can just do a, a web search for beekeeping association and the name of the state. And in addition, most counties or regions within states also have organizations. So once you locate a beekeeping organization, they can direct you directly to somebody who can help uh, with information and education. Livestock bans or restrictions. The bans on keeping various types of livestock often have the same origins as beekeeping bans, fear, ignorance, and misinformation. But many are also based on things that we don't encounter with honeybees, such as noise and odor. And once again, education is the key to creating appropriate ordinances. As with honeybees, there are organizations and resources available to those interested in creating or changing ordinances related to keeping livestock in urban areas. A good place to start is with municipalities that already have ordinances that are appropriate for urban agriculture. Look up things like the City of Chicago ordinance allowing chickens to be kept within the city limits. Um, just as with beekeeping, there are numerous urban farming organizations and some national and many local organizations that can provide information and education resources about livestock. Also, don't neglect departments of the federal government, primarily the Department of Agriculture, as a national resource. Their purpose is to promote agriculture and make sure agriculture 
can be practiced and is efficient. They have much information available. And an excellent resource for information and guidelines for livestock regulations for municipalities is a publication called Guidance and Recommendations for Connecticut Municipal Zoning Regulations and Ordinances for Livestock. Though it is specific to Connecticut, almost everything in there can be applied anywhere in the country. It's a very good resource. We also deal with location restrictions. Residential neighborhoods often have restrictions on the types of landscaping that may be done and the location of utility areas. Vegetable gardens are often defined in these regulations as utility areas, along with compost piles, tool and equipment storage areas. These types of restrictions might be citywide or very local, such as with homeowners associations. Once again, though, education is the key to establishing realistic regulations in such areas. Oddly, it might be easier to change citywide ordinances, though, than homeowners association regulations. Where can you turn for information regarding these types of local restrictions? Well, many of the most restrictive regulations are in areas covered by homeowners associations. There are several national organizations that represent or provide information about homeowners associations. HOA USA is an organization that provides information to and about homeowners associations. The Community Associations Institute is another organization that provides information to and about homeowners associations. Municipal ordinances require political involvement to change, and a good approach is to locate a successful, less restrictive ordinance in another municipality, and then use that as a guide for recrafting the ordinance in question. That's what partially happened in the Madison, Wisconsin beekeeping thing and in the city of Chicago uh, chicken keeping ordinance. Unkempt appearance restrictions. Because of the subjective nature of these types of restrictions and ordinances, usually the only way to affect change is through a program of education. Defining vegetable gardens as a legitimate part of landscaping can sometimes help, along with the explanations of the benefits to the community as a whole to allow something other than perfect lawns and landscaping to be placed in public areas of residential lots. These types of restrictions are generally most municipalities, cities, villages, townships have ordinances against unkempt appearances, but they typically are at their most restrictive um, in homeowners association areas. And sometimes it, it, you just can't change those restrictions. If they're going to be changed, however, education is the key. Watering restrictions. Well, clean, fresh water might be the world's most valuable resource. And it has been very difficult to change restrictions on watering. But sometimes, however, it's been possible to have vegetable gardens placed under less restrictive regulations than lawns and general landscaping. Um, since the goal, however, of this course and curriculum is sustainability in agriculture, this is one area where adapting to the restrictions may be the best solution. Um, we're allowed um, capturing runoff from building roofs, for instance, uh, or not, depending on their regulation, planting crops that can survive the climate that they're being planted in. Next, we come to processing facility requirements. Any place, any place where food is processed in some way, such as extracting or bottling honey, or washing and packaging vegetables is considered a food processing facility and is generally subject not only to local laws, but federal laws as well. Many of the laws regarding processing facilities have exemptions for small operations, so those exemptions are worth investigating. 
So there are many organizations representing both food processors and food processing equipment suppliers that can provide information and guidance regarding the regulations. Um, this is one of those cases where uh, if there are laws or ordinances regarding food processing, um, you're unlikely to get them changed, to be perfectly honest. So the key here is knowing what applies to you and what doesn't. What exemptions you may be eligible for and what, which ones you, you have to comply with. Um, and these organizations that we've listed, the National Food Processors Association, Midwest Food Processors Association, Northwest Food Processors Association, um, the Food Safety and Inspection Service is part of the United States uh, Department of Agriculture, can help you understand the regulations and make sure that you're meeting those requirements. And environmental regulations. The go-to source for information on environmental regulation is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. In addition to recommending creating and enforcing environmental regulations, the EPA also helps business owners understand and comply with these regulations. Their main purpose and their main goal is to make sure everyone complies. They're glad to provide whatever information they can to help you understand the regulations. EPA.gov is the EPA website, and one of the main menu choices from the home page of the website is laws and regulation. You can use that to look up regulations by industry, resource, or other categories. So you can find more easily those regulations that would apply to your operation. Some states have regulations that are more restrictive than the federal regulations, notably California. And in that case, the California EPA provides the information and help with its more restrictive regulations. Finally, we come to something we're calling socio-political issues, or these also fit in the category of territorial issues. Um, if restrictions or regulations are encountered in this area, and a homeowners association is a good example of a socio-political organization, education is your best tool. It seems that in every case, education is your best tool to overcome or modify such regulations. Many organizations have had to deal with the socio-political environment and have been successful in achieving change. So partnering with such an organization can be one way to move forward when you're trapped by these regulations. So while it's not an agriculture organization, Common Ground can offer resources for grassroots organization and change. Other groups such as Growing Power in Chicago may be able to assist with agriculture specific resources since that's what they do and they do it within an environment where there are restrictions applied. In these cases, probably your best bet is to locate an organization with similar concerns as yourself. So an urban agricultural organization that's successful, that's currently operating and partner with that organization to learn what you can and to become another part of the organization pressing for common sense regulation and change um, to allow uh, urban agriculture to take place and be productive and contribute what it can to the community. That's the end of this unit.